it again. Hi, everybody. Doesn't that week go by so, so quick? Before you know it, here we are again, another Wednesday evening. And thank you. Uh, the patent team would like to thank you so very much for joining us uh, these nine weeks in a row. Hard to believe that next week will be our last uh, session together. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Pam Kastner. I have the honor of serving as patent state lead for literacy. And joining me this evening are my colleagues from Patent East, Kirsten DeRoche Weitzel, and she just gave you a little wave, and Sherry Hartman. We're so excited to be with Dr. Haynes and Dr. Smith for this evening's session of Chapter 9 Structured Literacy Interventions for Written Expression. It's going to be an absolutely wonderful session with research, but lots and lots of practice. So we're so excited to have you here. Uh, we will continue to place in the chat all throughout the session as people join. Uh, the link to the Padlet that has all the curated resources for this book study series. You'll find the recordings, you'll find um, resources that the authors suggested, and in many cases as well, uh, questions that the authors have answered. So if you were with us last week, you know uh, that Dr. Stevens and Dr. Austin um, did an amazing presentation, but also they were very kind and have already answered the questions that we didn't have time to do in the session itself. So you'll find those answers on the Padlet, as well as everything that you need for chapter nine tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Kirsten DeRoche. She is going to share the bios of Dr. Haynes and Dr. Smith. You're in for a great evening. Yeah. Welcome everybody, and please join me in um, welcoming our esteemed guests this evening. So Charles Haynes, ND, CCC, SLP, is Professor for the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at MGH Institute of Health Professions. Dr. Haynes teaches courses in spoken and written language disorders and in language culture and cognition for the Master of Science in Speech Language Pathology Program and the Certificate of Advanced Study or CAS Program for Reading Specialists. In addition, he conducts research, mentors thesis students, supervises graduate students in the Institute's Speech, Language, and Literacy Center, and co-directs the Written Expressive Language and Literacy Collaborative. In June 2013, Dr. Haynes was inducted into the International Academy of Researchers in Learning Disabilities, and in 2012 received the Nancy T. Watts Award for Excellence in Teaching, the highest prize given to a faculty member at MGH Institute. He was inducted into the International Dyslexia Association's Hall of Honor in 2009 and received IDA's Margaret Rawson Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014. Dr. Haynes served as a teacher, research coordinator, and director of speech language services at the Landmark School from 1979 to 1991, where he and colleagues developed one of the nation's first language-based curricula for children with dyslexia and expressive language impairments. In 1991, Dr. Hayes and colleagues in the graduate program in communication sciences and disorders at MGH Institute helped to design and establish coursework and placements that offer the option of dual teacher certification in both speech, language, and in reading. Dr. Haynes has been the principal or co-principal investigator on over $1,100,000 worth of grants at the Institute and on over $2,700,000 of grant of externally funded studies in the Middle East and in Brazil, where he's currently collaborating with colleagues to develop diagnostic, and intervention tools for spoken and written Arabic, as well as Brazilian Portuguese. He's chaired or co-chaired several international conferences for the International Dyslexia Association, and currently serves as senior advisor on the Global Partners Committee of IDA's Board of Directors. He serves as an invited reviewer for several reading and speech language journals. And joining him this evening is Susan Lambrick Smith, Assistant Professor at the MGH Institute of Health Professions. She's a developmental psychologist and speech language pathologist specializing in research and teaching related to speech sound disorders and dyslexia. She has broad experience in a clinical SL, as a clinical SLP in the schools. Dr. Lambert Smith currently supervises in the speech language and literacy clinic, teaches coursework in speech sound disorders and literacy, and is co-director of the WELL -L or WELL Collaborative. 
Dr. Lambert Smith's current research examines efficacy of structured writing intervention for children with reading disorders and the link between early speech sound production and dyslexia. Please join me in welcoming both of them this evening. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to kick things off here by sharing my screen and getting started here. Um, so I, th I think most of you have are already familiar with the structure of the book that we're discussing, um, but I just wanted to quickly go through um, some of the things that we are going to talk about today and then an overview of the book. So we really want to recognize the content and key features of structured literacy approaches, reviewing uh, the research support for structured literacy, understanding the benefits for different reader writer profiles, including poor writers, um, learning uh, effective structured literacy instructional activities, and we're going to talk about some of those today, and implementing um, interventions successfully for a wide range of struggling readers. So we will have handouts available of this talk in the Padlet. I just wanted to point that out. So today, um, I'm going to start off by uh, talking about writing it and its relationship to structured literacy a little bit. We will touch on the uh, science of writing a little bit, um, but then Dr. Haynes is going to provide some detailed descriptions of selected intervention techniques at the word, sentence, microdiscourse levels. And finally, we'll touch on a lesson plan sequencing the steps of these strategies that we use in our in-house clinic. So to start, um, we've had a lovely introduction so far, um, but we are at the MGH Institute of Health Professions. Um, we do have a certificate of advanced study in um, language and literacy. And a guiding principle of our CSD program since its inception about 30 years ago, I was in the first class. Um, Charlie was teaching then, so we were both there at the beginning, um, is a very strong commitment and focus on literacy in clinical and research venues. Um, so the, the, the grounding of principle is that language is both spoken and written. So that's where we come from. Um, our clinical teaching and research mission of WELL, the Written Expression Language and Literacy Collaborative, um, are interwoven really. Uh, we, have, we provide a service to the community and to graduate students through our intensive writing clinic. And we partner with schools as well to explore written language instruction implementation. And that is what we're currently working very hard on. I have, there's a link there too, if you wanna find us later, that'll take you to our WELL page. So what do we mean by um, linguistic basis for writing instruction? Um, so while there are lots more elaborate models for capturing reading and writing, this is again, the basic set of principles at the core of what we do. And is that listening, reading, speaking, and writing are all language modalities and they are multi-directional. They inform one another. So the approach we're going to be talking about this evening, structured oral written language instruction is really based on this basic notion. And as we approach writing um, as both a linguistic and cognitive task, then we start thinking about, well, what elements are important to include? So you can see in this particular graphic, I've got paragraph at the top, and I think we spend most of our time thinking about paragraph level writing, about organization of paragraphs. There are is a plethora of programs out there that um, provide uh, all kinds of schema for writing at the paragraph level, but we think less about these basic building blocks of writing like vocabulary, micro discourse, and sentence level st structure. So um, these linguistic underpinnings, vocabulary, semantics, and word structure, sentence structure, including knowing all the sentence elements and the range of structure that kids can use, cohesion, using words and structures to create flow 
in between and within sentences and paragraphs. And then also um, using language to inform the way that we organize our thoughts and map sentences onto ideas. So we do have evidence, some good evidence that um, coning in on these levels, these multi levels for writing instruction um, is effective. So at the, um, at the word level, I'm not going to dive into each one of these studies, but kind of summarize each category, and then you're welcome to go back and, and look them up later. Um, but in the area of vocabulary, we have evidence that shows semantic feature analysis and teaching vocabulary and context are effective strategies for writing. At the sentence level, we know that explicit teaching of sentence structure um, using either sentence combining or in a combination with planning um, uh, writing is also effective. At the text level, using explicit visual frameworks along with language-based monitoring strategies has resulted in positive effects on writing. And some of you may be familiar with um, the SRSD self-regulated strategy development, which has been widely widely um, reviewed and widely, widely researched as, as an effective approach, we're going to add some elements to that by thinking about linguistic pieces. And I would also say explicit instruction along with those visual supports is also um, important to include. So I'm going to, at this stage, pass it along to Dr. Haynes, and he's going to go through some of these levels more explicitly and um, pull out uh, some of the strategies that we use and then talk about them. Thank you much, so much, Sue. And uh, it's such a treat working with Sue because she brings so much experience from the classroom and sort of welds that, melds that with her, uh, with her theoretical interests. Um, so what I've done is I basically extracted uh, section headers uh, which are a number of different strategies and techniques that are contained in the chapter. These are word level techniques. Uh, the asterisk ones, um, I'll spend, I'll park a little bit more on, uh, uh, but now the creation of noun and verb boxes, which is really an important strategy for, ch for children to use, uh, to learn that every time they're reading or listening, uh, and getting background knowledge around a given topic or theme that they employ uh, uh, boxes with key nouns and verbs. Um, for students who struggle with spelling uh, and haven't yet learned the spelling rule for the word that they're required, you know, that they're thinking of that they want to represent on the page, linking oral chaining with phonetic spelling is a really key important strategy to help them get their words on paper. They may not be perfectly spelled, but if they're phonetically spelled, um, you, the student and you can tell what the meaning is of what they're trying to uh, write. Um, another piece that we include is intrinsic and extrinsic cueing techniques and strategies to aid students who have difficulty with, uh, with word retrieval. Uh, and then I'll park a fair amount of time on uh, semantic feature mapping, which Sue had mentioned uh, earlier. I do want to emphasize that the next like 12 slides or so are adapted from a book by Terry Jennings and me entitled From Talking to Writing. And I want to make sure and recognize her immense contributions to uh, helping children who struggle with expressive language and also a protege of hers, Peter Harris at Landmark School, just an amazing, bright uh, young man who's doing very creative work. Um, next. So here's an example of noun and verb boxes. It's around a topic. I've decided I love beekeeping. I live on a farm north of Boston and have kept bees for probably 10 years. Uh, so I'm being constructively self-indulgent here. Uh, and so here we have some key nouns. You can imagine that a student is looking at a picture or they've watched a short video on beekeeping 
perhaps you've read them a story about bees and beekeeping, um, or they uh, have been able to decode or read a passage themselves. And uh, there's a lot of shrift given to close reading, uh, but uh, if we have students extract key nouns and verbs, that's right at the heart of close reading. It's also at the heart of close listening as well. Uh, so uh, examples of key nouns are like queen bee, brood chamber, scout bees, pollen, honey. And then on the right, you have examples of verbs uh, that, that might be associated uh, with them. Um, next. Uh, so Sue had mentioned uh, semantic feature mapping. Um, I decided to pick a slightly esoteric <laughs> noun, but it's actually central to beekeeping. Uh, if you're a beekeeper, if you've watched them at work, they use something called a hive tool to work on their hive. And so let's say that's our kind of key noun, for example. Uh, you can do... A, just straight on semantic mapping where children put any kind of random association that they have, or you can use structured mapping. And I find that for most students who have some good background, at least a beginning of background knowledge, doing structured mapping is particularly useful. So you'd indicate like for a, a central noun like hive tool, who's the agent, who uses it? Uh, what is the action? that that item does? Uh, what is it made of? Where do you find it? Uh, so uh, these are examples of structured uh, semantic feature mapping. And we'll see how they directly relate to sentence level work. So um, yeah, go ahead next, Sue. Thanks. Um, so we have a number of sentence level strategies and techniques in the chapter um, that we talk about. I'm going to hone in on a few of those. Uh, so, uh, and I may even give you a chance to sort of engage interactively in chat. So um, the first is this notion of tapping the semantic feature knowledge to support sentence expansion. I'll actually get into that more in just a minute. Um, we teach using a sentence hierarchy that's based on children's typical acquisition, young children, very young children's acquisition of sentence patterns. Um, the importance of, uh, you know, teaching students sentence patterns until they're internalized. But as soon as they're automatic with a sentence pattern, we don't just sit on that so that they're simply robotic. We actually have them experiment with moving parts of the sentence, like moving a when phrase to the beginning or a where phrase to the beginning. Um, uh, in a couple of minutes, I'll engage you in ways of reinforcing target patterns using listening, speaking, reading, and writing uh, to aid monitoring skills for monitoring for sentence parts. Um, we do some work with helping students to consolidate sentence skills uh, by engaging them in fluency drills. Uh, a researcher named Datchuk has done some small group studies demonstrating uh, that indicate that uh, engaging students in sort of three minute, um, we can call them sentence slams, where as quickly as possible, they write sentences that follow a given pattern uh, using nouns and verbs from their noun and verb boxes, that that helps aid their sentence writing fluency. And of course, the importance of visual scaffolding to at the beginning so that students can see the kind of key uh, elements of the uh, sentence pattern. So um, uh, if you can go on to next and we'll look at the semantic feature. So if you up in the upper left-hand corner, um, you'll recall that we talked about the importance of structured semantic mapping. And um, I suggested some kind of key elements about from an agent, you know, the action of the hive tool, composition, and so on. So at the first level, um, uh, it's fairly directly pulling from 
key semantic features. So uh, at a level one sentence, you can see, you can directly see features from the semantic feature map. At level two, they start to integrate some creativity in using those features. The beekeeper used the steel hive tool to separate frames in the beehive. So you can, if you look above, you can see many of those key elements in the semantic feature map. And at the third level, um, where you have got a complex sentence uh, with embedded clauses and so on, uh, at this level, students are exercising a lot of creativity and generativity in pulling on this background knowledge of semantic features. Standing next to the beehive, the beekeeper pried apart brood frames with his sharp steel hive tool. Uh, so I just wanted to emphasize that semantic feature work is actually expanding kids' background knowledge and expanding their vocabulary and concepts uh, as, as you do that. Uh, next. Uh, I mentioned using a sentence hierarchy. I had the privilege of working with Dorothy Tyak and Bob Gottsleben at what was then called the um, Scottish Rite Institute for Childhood. They called it Childhood Aphasia, and then they transitioned to Childhood um, Dysphasia. Uh, uh, and that, that was now we, I think we called the, the children, uh, we one of the sort of labels or categories that we have is developmental language disorders. Um, uh, that, that would be a sort of newer name, but we were doing research uh, analyzing uh, samples from about 110 young children. And we observed that in children ages two to four, uh, that there were some fairly consistent sentence patterns that appeared early, some that appeared sort of midway, and then around age three or four, where you had much more complex sentences. Here I've given you a kind of snippet from a hierarchy that my colleague Terry Jennings and I created at Landmark School uh, that's derived approximately from that order of acquisition that young children have. Um, and we try to use simple vocabulary uh, because one of the ironies of language instruction is that it's both the um, subject of what we're teaching uh, and the means by which we teach. So if we use complex grammatical language, many of our children, as you know, are lost. So using simple terminology, uh, as a kind of transitional language is really helpful for aiding their meta syntactic awareness. Um, I'll let you read this on your own uh, uh, next. So I promised you that I'd share with you ways of reinforcing monitoring skills. So this is a, this example happens to be a listening task. In the next slide, I'll actually engage you uh, you, you aren't going to just be listening anymore. You're going to have to be actually uh, applying what you're learning. Uh, but with this task, the teacher shows the selected target sentence pattern. In this case, it's an optional article, noun, plus verb, plus where. And they indicate it across the board. And then students listen to what the teacher says, listen to their production of a theme-centered sentence that uses our topical vocabulary. And they identify the teacher sentence as being correct, in which case they put a C, or incorrect, X. Um, and then later, if it's incorrect, the student then corrects the sentence so that it follows the pattern. So for example, a teacher might say, the beekeeper stood. And the student would mark an X on the paper because it's missing a where phrase. And then the student would, then the teacher would invite the student to correct the teacher's sentence. And the student might say, the beekeeper stood next to the hive. So that's the idea. That's a listening task. Because there are 284 of you, uh, I'm going to do this as a, and you can, it's easier to look at sentence patterns for people who are, are uh, fairly or very literate. Um, we'll now do uh, go on to the next slide, Sue. Um, uh, uh, 
so our target sentence is it's an optional article uh, and then a noun, some kind of verb or verb phrase and a where phrase. So let's do the first sentence and in chat, um, I'd like you to indicate. Um, so read that first theme centered or topical sentence and identify C if it's correct or simply identify X if it's incorrect. So that first sentence, um, is it following the pattern? And Dr. Haynes, I see lots of C's coming in. Okay, so you're saying lots of C's. And then what I would do is I'd follow up and I'd say, uh, to, and we can't do that here in this environment, but I would say, so why did you put C for that? And then have the student explain to me, well, the bees is, a, is my noun and swarmed is the verb and out of the hive tells where they swarmed. So it's a where phrase. And uh, so that allows them to exercise their uh, metalinguistic knowledge. The next sentence is honey flowed. I'm seeing many X's, Dr. Lots of X's. Lots of X's. And then what you do is after the X, you do X dash and you put the part that's missing. So make sure you do that in your response. And some of them are, they're saying, uh, it's coming too fast, X dash where. X dash where, excellent. So you got the idea. How about the next one? The beekeeper next to her hive. And I'm seeing X verb, Dr. Hayes. Yeah, X dash verb. So um, I would argue that this is a seminal form of proofreading. Uh, that we too often we give children these big proofreading checklists and we say, you know, follow each step and check it off. And what do they do? They check everything off. This is actually a functional, uh, rudimentary, but functional form of proofreading. So you can do this in listening, speaking, reading, or writing modalities. And in the book, it uh, elaborates on that. Thank you, uh, uh, Pam, appreciate that. Next, Sue. Okay, so micro discourse is a, term that I thought that I invented. I thought that I was very clever inventing this term micro discourse. And then I went online and I found that this Persian linguist, uh, then I guess Iranian now uh, linguist had uh, uh, coined the term for exactly the same use that I use it. Uh, I think of micro discourse as being two and three sentence chunks of text and what are the skills and techniques that you use for developing inter-sentence or between-sentence cohesion? What are ways that you can support elaboration in a way that supports uh, and is thematically related so that if you add a sentence, it actually relates to the sentence before it? Um, uh, for the, um, I'll give you, you'll actually get to engage in a cohesive tie uh, strategy application, but uh, we, won't, we don't have time to do the detail circle, but the detail circle is basically a circle that kids memorize. And the first two or three details are high frequency details, like a fact detail or a, why, a detail that tells why. Um, uh, those are, uh, th they're, super high frequency. And then once students have mastered using those details, then they add details. Uh, uh, but they have to memorize the detail circle. Memorization is not evil. Uh, it, it's actually really helpful if it has functional value. So if a student memorizes the detail circle, they can put it in the margin of their paper and use it as a reference to help them remember to add details. So we're gonna talk about the cohesive tie strategy. Uh, next, Sue. So here is, uh, this again is a strategy that is memorized by the student and they 
uh, learn to put it in the margin of their paper. And it reminds them to, as they move through longer sentences and from sentence to sentence, that if they have a recurrent noun or verb, actually, uh, you can think of a little bit of, about verbs, but in this case, I'm kind of focusing on nouns, that you want to change it up, that it makes it more interesting. So you start with your original noun. In the next sentence, if you uh, run into it again, you use a synonym, and then you'd use a pronoun for the uh, that noun, and then a synonym, and then you're back to your original noun. If it doesn't sound right to use a synonym, then try using a pr pronoun. So that's the idea. You learn it, and then you learn flexibility around applying it. Um, next. So what I've done here, uh, what Sue and I have done, is we've provided you with a paragraph in which the student has used a certain phrase multiple times. <laughs> We've highlighted it red to kind of get you right to the point right away. You might find other parts of it that are redundant, but that's particularly redundant. So what I'd like you to do in chat, this is a little tricky, but in chat, I'd like you to you know leave that first down, the beekeeper, and then the next time that it occurs, I'd like you to change it up with the synonym or pronoun and do that kind of altering. But what you'll do is instead of rewriting the whole paragraph, you'll just give um, your noun, synonym, pronoun in the sequence they occur. I'll read it aloud to you. Um, the beekeeper removed the heavy combs from the hive. The beekeeper used a hot knife to cut away wax and released honey and release honey. Then the beekeeper placed the frames into the extractor. The beekeeper spun the frames and honey slowly flowed out of the spigot into the bottom of the canister. So um, uh, if you can go I'm into seeing, chat. Yep, I'm seeing uh, she, worker, he, uh, professional. There was a word that flew by there. Uh, uh, yeah, so let's actually, why don't you, um, Pam, why don't you work with me on that one? Yeah, okay. So I'll start it out. The beekeeper removed the heavy combs from the hive. What's the next word? Um, she, you she, said she. Mm -hmm. She used a hot knife to cut away wax and release honey. Then. The keeper of bees. The, the keeper of bees, the worker, could be a farmer, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of neat synonyms. In fact, sometimes I'll have uh, kids do synonym boxes for frequently recurring. And then what's the last one? Um, this word, A-P-I-A-R-I-S-T. And I'm uh, sure you know how to pronounce that. <laughs> yeah, uh, apia has to do with bees. So the apiarist, yeah. Yes, the apiarist so spun the frames and the honey slowly flowed. So you got the idea. You can set children up with kind of prefabricated, uh, you know, five or six sentence chunks. Uh, if they have a lot of difficulty with language, you might wanna just do two sentences or three sentences. You decide on the chunk size. Uh, and then you can start to have them use this cohesion circle, the cohesive tie strategy to help them monitor their, uh, their own writing. Uh, you can have them circle redundant nouns. Go through and if you see a noun happening again, circle it. Or if you see a verb happening again, circle it. So verbs, you're not gonna have a pronoun, but you could have synonyms. All right, next. Uh, so I'm not going to, I wanna give short shrift to paragraph level principles, uh, not because they're unimportant. In fact, there's a good body of research indicating that self-regulated strategy development at that sort of macro level is super important. Um, at issue for Sue and me is that we see all of these children who struggle at the word, sentence, and micro discourse level. And that's why we're strongly emphasizing that piece. Um, but at the paragraph level, you wanna make sure that you prepare students for writing with oral rehearsal. 
uh, and uh, uh, around uh, and then engaging them in topical sentence instruction. That will support them when they get to that sort of uh, paragraph uh, level. You also want to teach sentences that support paragraph logic. Well, what, what does that mean? <laughs> if we have a paragraph, it's a contrast paragraph where, the, where we're trying to have the student make contrasts, then practice with sentences that include those kind of uh, key words that signal contrast can be very helpful. Words like however, while, although, and so on. Uh, so if you're doing, uh, maybe you're doing a paragraph that's talking about similarities. So you'd use words like like, as, and so on. Uh, Leslie Laud introduced us to this concept of TIDE, this acronym, T-I-D-E. Um, I imagine that many of you are, uh, if, if you're familiar with TIDE, uh, enter that into the chat, just say yes. <laughs> so, so we can get a sense of if you've heard of the TIDE acronym. Yeses and noes. Uh, some yeses and some noes. So mm -hmm. TIDE, um, T stands for topic. In other words, topic sentence. I is a key idea. D is a detail. Uh, and what we usually do is we do T, ID, 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 and then E is the ending sentence or concluding sentence. And that uh, students memorize that and they put, they use TIDE to just remind them the, of the T, ID, and E pieces. And then they write out on the paper uh, to help structure their paragraph. That's a very useful acronym. Some of you probably have other acronyms that you use that you found to be effective. Um, then when you move to the multi-paragraph structure, um, it's actually, if you've done good work at the word, sentence, and micro discourse level, like where you're learning how to add uh, detail sentences and so on, you got strategies for doing that. It's actually really easy to build multi-paragraph structures by expanding key points that are, in, that, that are in your single paragraph. So maybe your single paragraph has like three main ideas, maybe with a detail. Well, you can take each one of those and expand those into a whole paragraph by adding additional details. And Carly, then you're, you asked me to let you know when it's 7.40. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we're, we're pretty good now at this point. Yeah, thanks, Sue. Uh, so that's a rapid fire overview of paragraph level uh, principles and strategies and techniques. Uh, but again, we're giving that a relatively short shrift because that's where most of the work is being done. If you have high stakes exam, like a, in Massachusetts, we have something called the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System. And teachers start uh, getting nervous uh, in the month or month and a half before the high stakes exam. So they start doing paragraph structure activities with the children. That's not bad and it can be helpful, certainly. I wanna make sure and acknowledge that, but you're missing a lot of key work at the word sentence and micro discourse level that can really beef up the quality of kids writing. Next. So to quickly summarize, Sue mentioned the value of integrating listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And we both would acknowledge that there are much more comprehensive models for writing. Um, even if you looked at something like the quote unquote, simple view of, of, of reading and writing, you would see it's got multiple components in it. Uh, many of you see, have seen Hollis Scarborough's rope metaphor um, that has elements of this listening, speaking, reading, and writing in it. But our key points that we want to share with you is that oral language really needs to provide a foundation for writing. You want to make sure and use thematic or topical vocabulary. Have students use that, create word boxes. That's going to provide content for their language learning exercises. 
Then you're going to support paragraph and multi-paragraph level writing with exercises at the word, sentence, and micro discourse level. Activities like the ones that I shared with you. And just make sure and exploit synergies among those key components of language, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sue because we've been doing some neat work uh, both in a school south of Boston, um, but also in uh, a some our summer writing uh, program. And we've learned a lot from the students that we've worked with. Go ahead, Sue. Okay, so this is just a, a schematic of our, our lesson plan. It's our tree structure for, for the lesson plan that we use in our in-house clinic. Um, so we start with a broader scope. Um, which is really topical brainstorming. So if we stick with the B theme, we would be using um, some kind of picture or a video uh, about beekeeping and then doing some brainstorming, which I think is probably pretty familiar um, to all of you. But while we're doing the brainstorming, we're starting to build those vocabulary boxes that Charlie was talking about. So we're getting down some uh, key nouns, some verbs, some adjectives, or if kids are that uh, far along. Um, and then we move to what we're calling topic concepts. Um, we're, we're working, we happen to be working on expository writing. So at this level, we incorporate a passage. So there's some reading that we do with the children. Um, and we're analyzing or writing prompt. We're using close reading to locate key information uh, from the text. And uh, we usually use a visual map. Now this could be something similar to the one we use later um, that's like a tide, but a visual map where we're pulling out ideas and, and some primary details. Critically, we're also adding to those vocabulary boxes. So we're talking about the text, but we're also, again, pulling out key nouns and verbs that we may not have picked out when we were doing the brainstorming phase. Then we move to the word level. And at this level, we select key vocabulary terms to analyze to help grow semantic networks. Um, and how you analyze this could be developmental. So for example, Charlie gave the, the example of hive tool um, and a structured map for doing that. You could select a word such as apiary. Um, and then you could add not only synonyms like bee yard, but you could add morphology, apian related to bees. Um, and now I'm going to pronounce it wrong. A AP, what was the word that we had earlier that was someone who is a a apiarist? <laughs> apiarist, that was it. Okay, thank you. That was great. Um, so, so then you're pulling in not only parts of speech, but, but morphology as well. So you can play around with these semantic networks. Um, at the sentence level, we're pulling down, again, the key vocabulary that we started with. And uh, many of our kids are working on an expanded kernel sentence at that level. So we ask the students to generate several sentences using that structure and the word boxes that they've been using from the beginning at, for the lesson. So the, again, like Charlie said, the reason for doing this is to help them internalize that sentence pattern. So we're still working with the topical vocabulary, but we're now pulling it to the sentence level. Then we're starting to go back out and we then go to the micro discourse level. And at this stage, whoops, at this stage, um, we are uh, incorporating the cohesion circle and or the detail circle. Um, with the cohesion circle again, the kids are generating a key noun that they're going to use in their paragraph. So they're doing that a priori. So they're working through that cohesion circle, the synonyms and the pronouns before they write their paragraph. We could go back and use it as an editing tool later as well. If we're introducing a new detail type, so for example, if we're introducing Y detail, um, there could be an activity relating linking sentences with because which would lend itself very well to um, providing uh, added cohesion using that Y detail. So you're, we're also working on linking sentences as well. So that could be something for a child who's a little bit more advanced to, the, um, to, to linking sentences to conjunctions. 
Um, so finally, um, students are really ready to transcribe all of these ideas into their paragraph. They usually label T-I-D-I-D-I-D right down the side of their paper because they're used to doing this um, and turning their ideas and details into sentences. Um, we do use that mnemonic. Um, then while they're doing that, they can make use of all the strategies and the tools that they've already put into that planning. So they've got their word boxes, they've got examples of sentence structures, they've got their cohesion circle and their concept map. And they're using all of that to generate their paragraph. So we've taken a lot of the cognitive load, that memory load that you're not, you're having to do all of this at the same time that you're writing the paragraph. We've done that already. So um, while we tell kids it's a little bit of more work at the beginning, it's going to save you. It's going to be less effortful later. So I think that's the end of our talk for today. It's been such a pleasure to be here. Um, we'd be happy to take some questions at this stage. And hey, I will Dr. stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Haynes. It was just an amazing presentation. Thank you so very much. And we learned a new word, at least I did this evening. So thank you for that. I'm sure I'm not the only one. <laughs> Actually, there were just a couple of questions, unless I missed, because I'm always trying to do uh, keep care of the chat and everything else that's going on. But I only had two, so please, if I missed that, any, please let me know. But here's what I have. All right. Um, from Michelle, do you recommend sentence diagramming? I'm going to take that chart. <laughs> it really depends on the student. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a student who has really strong uh, memory, who has uh, is really does not have a language disorder, um, and they can intuit sentence patterns really quickly, um, then sentence diagramming, formal sentence diagramming, can be really helpful. Um, you can believe it or not, if you provide a student a pattern noun, verb, you know, optional article, noun, verb, where, when, and maybe you want to put an adjective in front of the noun or whatever. That is sentence diagramming, but it's a kind of interform, mm -hmm. uh, sort of intermediary form mm -hmm. of sentence diagramming. So um, I think that it's directly helpful. Any of you who are familiar with the, 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 the great kind of framing your thoughts, uh, materials. Yeah. Many of us were trained in that early on. Um, at that point, they're primarily using icons, but that is really sentence diagramming. So if you have a straight line, that's a noun. The zigzag like lightning is movement. Uh, a triangle that has a where, triangle that has a when. Uh, so, um, that is sentence diagramming. So it kind of depends on how you define sentence diagramming, mm -hmm. and it depends on the level of the student. But uh, depending on their linguistic abilities, you start at the level that they need to be at to understand, uh, to develop medicine tactic awareness. Thank you. And I, I would add to that by also saying that doing, doing it in isolation, not linked to um, content is also not as effective. Thank you. Um, the next question I had was from Maureen. Does how or why follow the noun plus a verb or just when and where? So uh, depends on how you define how. I mean, how could be a detail that explains how you do something or how could be an adverb. And you need to make strategic decisions. If, it, if, if I have children who have a lot of it, um, at some of the schools that I've worked with, I've been, I've worked with children who had uh, fairly severe language difficulties, but they were ready for adverbs. And I just post, I had them put them right after the verb. And I said that, and you're going to do LY verbs. You know, I was highly restrictive in terms of allowing um, adverbs. So if you meant ad, if you meant um, adverb is in how, uh, that's a very quick response to that. But how can also be a detail as well, a fact, a factual detail. 
All right, I, I, um, they're coming in now, so I'm trying to do both, but um, I know there was a question I just saw about e, uh, English language learners for writing strategies. Um, any suggestions there? So, I'm, and I'll go back in and look uh, while you're talking. Yeah, so for those of you who've been around for a while, and Sue, I'm sure you're gonna have some insights as well, but mm -hmm. um, a long time ago, we started with kind of structured language methods that we were using with English language learners um, for the children who had more difficulty learning English. We realized that that was somewhat bankrupt if, it, if we were not having it based on a topic, on topical vocabulary, on meaningful words, because it uh, they had so much need for vocabulary and kind of uh, English vocabulary and kind of concept ways of expressing concepts in English. Uh, but in fact, much of the work that you're looking at now had its roots in uh, TESOL and uh, ELL uh, work. Thank you. Um, can you address editing proofreading student work? Are we asking for perfection or do we let some mistakes go? Oh, that's Sue, why don't, you go, why don't you go for that? Yeah, and then I can add if you want. Uh, you know, I, we, we, uh, we, it, I think it depends on the child, quite frankly. Um, we do it as needed. The primary focus for our kids, because they are struggling readers and kids who are struggling with expressive language, is to get the ideas down on paper. Um, to fought to you know use all the strategies that we've taught them um, we do want them to use beginning capitalization and punctuation because it's important for separating their ideas it's really important for them to know when does their idea start and when does the sentence end so uh, we do edit for that uh, we spelling is very important we for our kids, we encourage them to spell phonetically. So that is if they cannot, because we don't there again, if there's a word that they want to use, we don't want to get in the way of them using that word because they don't know how to spell it. So um, we don't have a huge focus on that in our in our clinic, uh, but recognize that it is important. It just doesn't take the primary focus. So I would say editing as needed. And I just wanted to remind you that those sentence level activities that we were doing, uh, where you would you had a sentence frame on the board and you were either reading or listening, that that is really right at the heart of proofreading, at least for kind of syntactic elements. So that can aid and support um, students proofreading of their own papers. Hopefully, if they're using this level of of structure, they won't their ideas are going to be at least organized in such a way that there's not going to be a lot of at least run on, you know, a whole page full of just run on stuff that it's going to have some form to it so that there's not as much to do. We probably have time for just two more. Um, we are really struggling with how to start in kindergarten. What should it look mm -hmm. like for our youngest learners? The core has us writing phonetically, which is great. Oh, but I lost the rest because when I scooted down. So Jen, if you want to unmute, if I missed some of that, because um, once I moved it, it went. But uh, so what, what about youngest learners? What suggestions? And Jen, you can feel free to unmute if I've <laughs> not done it well. Okay, I think my microphone's working. Um, at my school, we have been doing uh, science of reading for quite a while now. So we have a pretty strong base in phonics and we feel pretty good about our ex explicit phonics teaching. So now we, when we look at writing, we're like, this, this isn't right. Looking at a word wall, copying words, it's just not right. So when we go to start writing, like where, where do you start with the youngest kids to have them with writing? At the end of the year in our standards, it says um, that they need to write personal narratives, but it doesn't give us any structure as to how to get the kids. It's like, okay, we'll start out your word using phonics. And then it's like, now write a complete story on it. Like how do we get there? Charlie, do you want to talk yeah, about I can, um, You definitely do want to um, start with just oral brainstorming around a given topic, um, but doing it in a way that's systematic. I, I found that when I first started teaching, one of the biggest mistakes I made was I would say, okay, tell me about this topic. 
but with no visuals to kind of root students. Any of the teachers here would probably laugh or smile when you can imagine having a group of six or seven um, students who have a lot of language difficulties, uh, inattention, and so on. Uh, but starting with a good, rich picture that has a sort of implied story in it, is a really useful way of starting brainstorming around a given uh, a given topic. Videos are useful, but just be really careful to stop them uh, periodically, and then you can transcribe what students say. Uh, and you can transcribe, you can create word boxes and verb boxes. Um, in, uh, in our chapter, I don't think we spent a ton of time talking about narrative. Um, but in the uh, in Terry's in my book, from talking to writing, we do a ton of work on narrative. If that will help you out, um, uh, uh, there is really good work that you can do around structuring uh, narrative, uh, uh, and um, I, I think building background knowledge vocabulary and concepts is really key. Letting students see it on the board as they produce it. So instead of just providing them with a, a box full of words that you created, um, have them co-create with you and you augment um, sort of classic zone approximal development idea. Okay, so I think that we'll end with questions there. I will save the chat because some came in uh, later into our uh, presentation. And so if you don't mind, if, uh, I'll check in with you through email to see if you'd be willing to answer the couple that we didn't get to. And um, I hope that, I wish that you could see the chat because all during the, the presentation, um, so much thanks. And I'm gonna use this idea and this is wonderful. And uh, so uh, I think you definitely, uh, I know what your goal was and you certainly met it and exceeded it. So thank you so much. We're truly honored that you came and joined us this evening. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And good luck with your teaching, everyone. Uh, when we see one another, when you see Sue and, and or me at IDA or any conference. Please come see um, Yeah, and yeah. come visit us if you come to Boston. We'd be happy yes. to show you around the Institute. We'd love thank to. you. Yes, the patent team has been lucky to see um, you at um, IDA. And we're dear friends of Nancy Hennessy, who I think is a friend of yours. Yeah, well. who's who's a dear friend of mine as well. Yeah, yeah she does such great work in the area of comprehension. She does. And we she did a book study of her book as well. <laughs> Good. So, I have right, a copy so, of it right here. I bet you do. Yeah. <laughs> So just a brief and quick reminder um, that next week we will have our last session for chapter 10 and Dr. Louise Pierce Swirling launched this book study series and she's gonna close it up. It's also during our patent literacy symposium. So boy, <laughs> you're really gonna have your literacy brains full by then. Um, next week is the patent literacy symposium, June 14th, 15th and 16th. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Louisa Motes will launch this uh, symposium with her keynote about phonemes and Tracy Whedon will join us on Thursday as a keynote and then Anita Archer. But as you know, we have 75 sessions. Uh, we have over 3,600 registered for the symposium. But if you haven't registered yet, you still can. And as you know, it's free and it's virtual. Also, we curate and record all of those sessions so that you know you can continue that learning. I know a lot of people have told the team that they've had a hard time choosing the one because there were so many great sessions at the same time. So no worries, those are recorded as well as a 2020 symposium which has had over 160,000 views. So um, the symposium will be around uh, long after two, but we're excited about that next week. And then Sherry's going to provide the code for everyone for Act 48 and share some information about next week. Okay, thanks again for joining us for this evening's book study session. We're grateful to Dr. Smith and Dr. Haynes for deepening our knowledge of chapter nine, Structured Literacy Interventions for Written Expression. The recording for this presentation will be added to the Patent Literacy Resource Hub and can be found at the link that's in the chat, um, as well as on the Patent YouTube channel.